Hi, this is Liz Posen, clinical psychologist here in Melbourne, Australia. It's uh, mid-November 2019. We're about to move from spring into a rather dangerous uh, summer in terms of bushfires here in Australia. I want to welcome all the new subscribers. There's been quite a few of you who've come along. I'm not too sure how you found me. Perhaps YouTube has uh, suggested you uh, come and have a look at some of my videos about anxiety, particularly how it relates to fear of flying. And I'm very grateful that you're here. Please have a look down below. There are, will be comments on a variety of the videos that I've been creating. And uh, please contribute to that. And by all means, ask me questions. Uh, bear in mind that uh, the advice or guidance I would give you is generic and not just about your situation. There is no clinical relationship here as such. Today, in this particular um, short video, one of a couple that I want to produce, and depending on where you are in your road to overcoming your anxiety and putting it into the history basket, um, this will be of value to you. This won't just be about flying. It will apply to any sort of anxious situation that you find yourself in. So I hope you'll find it uh, useful. Uh, behind me, to my um, over my right shoulder, uh, is my faithful dog, Scout, uh, resting. He's usually in most of... This is my therapy room, by the way. He's usually in most of my sessions uh, with me. You can see behind me, if I lean this way, uh, the airline seats that I use uh, in some of my work with uh, with some patients with fear of flying. Uh, that particular uh, setup uh, is useful for my uh, fle fear of flying work, which I use some virtual reality with. This is a an Oculus Go, um, but I also have an Oculus Quest, which I'll talk about in a future session. Uh, very excited about that particular bit of equipment. And this is all about... Um, exposing patients to their feared situation now, not just flying but it could be driving or public speaking or uh, an underground uh, uh, railway wherever it might be uh, all very useful uh, as part of the probably the best evidence we have for what works well with um, with anxiety especially with fear of flying and that's why the, the seats are there and those seats are equipped to rattle and move and have sounds and vibrations so add an extra element of reality to it. I've labelled this particular uh, video um, how to become an iron chef of your anxiety. Now, I don't know how many of you know about the original iron chef program uh, that was out of Japan a couple of decades ago. It's been reproduced in the United States and I think in Canada and other places. And it was one of the first um, cooking competition shows it was it's not certainly not the first to talk about cookery um there have been many many shows going back into the 50s uh, 1950s about how to be a better cook or better preparer of meals but in terms of competitions um iron chef was one of the first way before master chef and uh, and uh, the other ones that gordon ramsay has has done so just to set this up about what iron chef is about let's have a look at the introduction uh, which repeats each hour episode uh, this was the introduction to the whole of the um, Iron Chef series and it sets up what Iron Chef is about so let's have a quick look five years ago a man's fantasy became reality in a form never seen before a giant cooking arena a kitchen stadium the motivation for spending his fortune to create Kitchen Stadium was to encounter new original cuisines, which could be called true artistic creations. On a to realize his dream, he first secretly started selecting the top chefs of various styles of cooking. And he named his men the Iron Chefs, the invincible men of culinary skills. Iron Chef Japanese is Masaharu Morimoto. Iron Chef French is Hiroyuki Sakai. Iron Chef Chinese is Chen Kenichi. And Masahiko Kobe is Iron Chef Italian. 
The Kitchen Stadium is the arena where iron chefs await the challenges of master chefs from around the world. Both the iron chef and challenger have one hour to tackle the theme ingredient of the day, using all their senses, skills, creativity, there to prepare artistic dishes never tasted before. And if ever a challenger wins over the Iron Chef, he or she will gain the people's ovation and fame forever. Kitchen Stadium is the arena where you will meet the master chefs from around the world and their artistic creations. What inspiration will today's challenger bring? And how will the Iron Chef fight back? The heat will be on! So. The whole idea behind Iron Chef is to pitch a challenger up against one of three or four Iron Chefs, as they came to be called, in a kitchen stadium with judges um, who are going to evaluate the meal. And of course, one of the most exciting, there are several exciting moments, aha moments in this whole series. Uh, and one of them is, well, who was the challenger? What was their background? Two, who are they going to choose, French or Chinese or Italian or Japanese? And then three, perhaps the most exciting part was uh, the big reveal uh, of tonight's ingredient. And usually there was just one ingredient. And of course, the task was to make new dishes, exciting new dishes from that one ingredient, uh, an appetizer, a, a, an entree or, or main course as it's called here in Australia, uh, a, a dessert and perhaps a soup, often from ingredients that you wouldn't ordinarily see in all four categories of, of meal. And, and the idea was to, um, to make something special that perhaps was unique. Uh, for that night's cooking and then to be judged as to who met the criteria for the best um, food preparation presentation and so forth. Now when I speak to patients about Iron Chef, the thing that I use, why I use this as an example, is that the Iron Chef has to have a deep and abiding understanding, a profound understanding of the of that singular ingredient what it contains what other ingredients will it go with uh, to produce a, a pleasing presentation and taste it's a profound understanding of that ingredient but it's not just the ingredient that requires a profound understanding it requires a profound understanding of cookery methods basting roasting freezing cooling sauteing, whatever it might be, how do you best cook this particular food in all those four styles, an entree, main course, as we said, an appetizer, a dessert. You have to have a profound understanding of cookery methods and how things go together. Okay, So it's a deep and abiding understanding. You can't just be someone who follows a menu because there is no menu. You have to come up with the menu and from time to time when you watch this particular program occasionally you'd see one of the chefs usually the challenger maybe the iron chef their eyes are delighted about the particular food that is tonight's reveal tonight's ingredient because they have deep understanding of that other time you can see a look of fear on the faces of the iron chef or the uh, or confusion on the face of the Iron Chef or the Challenger because I'm not too sure what I'm going to do with this food. I don't really understand this particular food and I, I had prepared, I'm not prepared for this one. And so you can see the look of consternation or confusion. Other times it's deep pleasure because I really understand. This is my, this is my specialization. 
Occasionally you'd see either the Iron Chef or often the Challenger would, while they're, or while their helpers would go around collecting all the various ingredients and laying them out, the Challenger would often stand uh, at the preparation desk and in Japanese calligraphy, write out the menu. And occasionally the commentators or the judges would say, well, they're wasting a little bit of time, aren't they? And I always thought to myself as a psychologist, no, you don't get it. What they're doing is bring their anxiety levels down by developing a plan for what they're going to do, writing out the menu rather than rushing around like a hairy goat. Just write it all down. Yes, it might take two, three minutes. Um, but this is, this is like exam preparation. But rather than rushing in to answer exam questions, you sort of think about your preparation. You make a, a little, uh, if you're going to write an essay, you sort of write down the main points that you want to cover and then go for it. And that, that's what writing it down. It's a bit like a sports person who's getting dressed for their sport, puts on one piece of equipment, then another piece, another piece. It's a way of containing anxiety rather than simply liberating it and being uncontrolled. So that's how I always saw it. Now, this is a deep and profound understanding of food and its methods of being cooked. I want to contrast this with another form of cooking, of meal preparation, and that's that which takes place in a diner. I like going to American diners in particular. They've been featured in various films. There was one film even called Diner. Uh, perhaps the most famous diner experience that's been uh, portrayed in film is the one from the film Five Easy Pieces with um, Jack Nicholson and the late Peter Fonda, where things don't quite go according to plan uh, in the preparation of eggs at a diner. Diners are interesting uh, uh, American experiences. Um, people go to diners on a regular basis and they expect to see the same food prepared the same way each time they go in. This is not gourmet cooking. This is not experiencing new things. This is experiencing very familiar, very comforting sort of food. And people go back to often family-owned diners year after year after year. And if they order spaghetti bolognese, it doesn't change in 20 years. There's something very comforting about eating in a diner. And often the menus are huge. So many things to choose from versus the haute cuisines, the, the three-star Michelins, which we're trying to emulate with Iron Chef. Very small amounts of food on the platter, not comfort food. It's all about taste and presentation. You'll often leave hungry, but it's about the experience of eating in such an environment. Okay, there's a difference. But the other difference is this, that if you're a short order cook compared to an Iron Chef, your task is not to be experimentalist. Your task is to follow what might be family held traditional ways of preparing a meal, the bolognese sauce, the, the lamb shank, whatever it might be, that's been handed down over the decades from generation to generation. So it becomes very predictable. If an ingredient that goes into that meal is not available that day, or for some reason it's off, there is no real room for substitution here for creativity. That particular item is off the menu. Okay. So the, the, the short order cook, he or she has to have experience and the skill set to be able to produce the same meal over and over again quickly and accurately. People don't want to wait hours for their meal in a diner. It's got to come out really quick, usually large amounts, and be the same from week to week to week to week. Because that's what I go. I go for that diner's spaghetti bolognese. I go for that diner's pizza. And if you look at, at the various um, food apps, the travel apps, you know, they'll often say, go for this particular diner's, you know, steak, wherever it might be, and, and their special sauce or their cob salad. So there's room, I want to suggest to you, for two types of approaches to cookery. The Iron Chef, deep, profound, but, and is able to deal with novel, unexpected situations, a new ingredient that I didn't expect, versus the short order cook, whose task is to make the same meal over and over again, accurately and quickly. When we apply it to, the de to dealing with anxiety, I like my patients, my preference would be for my patients to become iron chefs, to be able to handle whatever new things get thrown at them, rather than 
Things have to happen in a certain way, otherwise I'm lost. And this is why so many people will set up special rules or rituals. I have to sit in that place on the plane. I have to take the plane at that time of the day. I have to fly in that particular area of the plane. I can only fly in that sort of aircraft type. Okay. I have to check what the weather's going to be like on the day. Otherwise, I don't know what's going to happen to me, but I fear the worst. The iron ship approach is to say, throw whatever you like at me. I can handle it. It's a mastery approach versus a coping approach. If someone comes to me and says, and today as I'm recording this, it's a Tuesday, and someone says, Les, I've got to fly to London on Monday, it doesn't particularly matter uh, the reasoning. It could be a, po a very positive thing. It could be, in fact, a, an unfortunate life event, but they've got to be there on that Monday. I would probably take the short order cook approach and just say, here's the skills. Don't worry about a deep and profound understanding of anxiety. Just follow the menu. Just do these sort of things. And when you come back from London, if you wish to continue because clearly just getting to London and having solved this problem of getting there won't be sufficient for the life ahead of you of flying, then come back and we'll take the Iron Chef approach, a deep understanding of your anxiety and what to do about it, especially if you encounter unpredictable things. Uh, unpredictable for you, but predictable in the normal flow of how commercial aviation works. Then you're going to have a methodology to work it through. But if you just need to get to London by, by Monday, here, just follow these steps and let's practice them in the virtual. Let's practice doing these things just for e each day for a little while and let's see how you go. It's not going to be brilliant, but at least you'll get to where you're going and you'll come back. Okay. But many people do come to see me saying, you know, I kind of try when I, once I've explained the, this, this concept, they'll say to me, look, I've been doing short order cook stuff for the last several years and I can see where it's going. It's actually getting worse the more I do it this way. I think I really need to do a deep dive into understanding my anxiety. And the good thing about this is that the techniques that we work with with Iron Chef uh, as the approach, a deep and profound understanding of anxiety, um, will also translate into other domains apart from flying, uh, public speaking, tunnels, bridges, social relationships even. Um, because one has a what's called a transdiagnostic approach. One has a deep understanding of the neuroscience of anxiety. What's going on inside our brains? That's our starting point. And I'll pick that up the next time we do another video. But I just want to put this out there that in the long run, if you really want to make this anxious part of your life a, a historical part, not an ongoing and perhaps worsening part, I think it's best to take that Iron Chef deep, profound understanding part where you push yourself to confront the worst that you think is going to happen. That And in the Iron Chef world is, I don't know what the ingredient is. I don't get to choose what I want to put on that menu. It's chosen for me already. Gosh, that's not what I do in my own restaurant. But that's what this competition is all about. That's why we find it exciting to see the best in the world somewhat momentarily confounded and have to think deeply about what they're doing. And I want this to be your approach too in the long run, that no matter what gets thrown at me in the usual course of flying and other life situations, I can develop a plan to manage it rather than saying, oh my God, I don't know what's going to happen to me next and therefore suffer even more anxiety. So that's the setup. That's what we're going to be doing in the next couple of videos, taking a more iron ship approach and really pushing you quite in a challenging way to confront some of your beliefs, ideas, thoughts, behaviors, sensations, and ultimately feelings, and see what can be changed and where that change can be done and how that change can be practiced so that you get rid of the old, automatic, deeply entrenched ways of going about things and replacing them with newer ways of doing things, new for you, but which better match a what the evidence is and better match what the challenges are that you'll be facing with your flying. One last little thing. Uh, last week, when I flew to Uluru, Ayers Rock, uh, for a weekend, one of my jaunts out of Melbourne that I do with my partner, we had an interesting situation as we were coming into Melbourne Airport. You can actually see it on the on the video now. Uh, here's our flight coming in. And uh, as we're on final approach, I thought to myself, 
something's not quite right here. And next thing I know, full power's applied and we're climbing away. My partner momentarily gripped my, my arm and I said, look, it's a go around. Obviously there's something happening on the runway. And uh, you can see now the recording that I made after the event when we landed to have a look. Um, flight radar because of, I have a gold membership of that allows me to go back here and have a look at the history and you can see that we did a go around uh, and the reason being that there was a, another aircraft that was late to get off the runway out of timing we were told to go around pretty standard thing that happens at most international airports uh, several times a day that's number one number two uh, flew um, last week with a patient down to Hobart uh, she had been a sufferer of motion sickness, as I do from time to time. We chose Hobart um, because it's in a geographical area which is prone to lots of low-end turbulence, that is mechanical turbulence, winds coming up from the north or the south, mountainous areas. And yet we copped a fair bit of turbulence going into Hobart. She coped quite well. Back on the plane coming home, we copped, of course, some going out more bumpy than I had expected, then another 15,000 feet when I expected the seatbelt sign to go off. We copped another heap of turbulence, people around us go, whoa, and my patient managed herself really well. Um, and in fact, when we got into the flight deck and she asked about the turbulence, um, fortunately the, the pilot said, as I had expected he might, um, yeah, we don't get many days of turbulence like that, that was pretty bad. To which I asked her when we got back into the into the terminal, sat down, had a cup of tea, I said, well, what do you make of all of that? And she said, well, I guess if I can get through that, I can get through anything. That's the Iron Chef approach. In fact, at one point when things had smoothed out a little bit, uh, she actually fell asleep, which is another piece of evidence that she did quite well. I won't go into any more details about that, but she was quite happy with, uh, uh, with her outcome and she'll be flying down to Hobart with her family in another couple of weeks' time. So I'll get some feedback about that. Anyway, thought I'd pass it on to you more videos to come. Again, thank you for being a subscriber. Ask questions down below and uh, I'll be back with more videos later, I hope this week. Bye for now.